Welcome to MOOC course on introduction to proteogenomics. In previous lecture, you have heard Dr. Henry Rodriguez, he gave you very nice and broad overview of the field of proteogenomics, especially cancer proteogenomics, the major milestones which have been achieved and what kind of challenges which lies ahead for the community. Now we are going to talk in much more detail in depth about first genomics module, then proteomics and then we will try to integrate the big data and proteogenomics to make meaningful insight. In this light, the first lecture today is going to be by Dr. Kelly Rogels. She is assistant professor at New York University in USA and she is going to talk about genomics, one of the major aspect to understand the comprehensive view of any disease or any system. Dr. Kelly will talk to you about the diversity of omics in biomedicine and especially the milestone which have been achieved using genomic technologies, various type of mutations like hereditary or acquired mutations which affect different type of diseases especially in context of oncology. What are the publicly available where one could try to study and find the mutation studies and related data sets which are publicly available. Along with that the basics of gene sequencing and methodology will be covered as well. Okay, hi. Uh, so, I am Kelly Ruggles. Um, I am an assistant professor at NYU and um, I am going to give you an introduction to genomics. Just to start, I wanted to just give you an idea of what my lab does um, to give you a little context about who I am and what, what I focus on. So, um, our lab really is interested in applying multi-omics integration methods across a lot of different um, questions and diseases. Um, this includes cancer, the human microbiome, and I do a little bit of work with pop health. I'm obviously just going to talk about the cancer stuff today, but um, we do sort of think about the integration across not just cancer, but all um, lots of different scientific questions. And um, really what um, we're interested in is looking, uh, taking a systems approach to human disease. So looking at um, combining omics at the cellular level, so understanding um, how proteogenomics um, within molecular networks interacts and how that impacts disease. Um, also thinking about intercellular uh, multi-omics, so not just within one cell but across many different cells. And then um, in some cases if we have the data, which is of course the, always the limitation, um, if we can look at inter-organ multi-omics, so if you have many different organs and many different omics, you can really have a, a very large and compre comprehensive view of, of human disease. And I think this is really the goal and we're starting to get there um, as, as we're able to generate more and more data. Um, so I think everybody here is going to eventually um, touch on many of the things in this slide, so I wanted to bring it up in the beginning. Um, so, really we're going to be talking about all, all levels except not metabolomics, I don't think anyone here is going to be talking about that, but um, in terms of genomics, epigenomics, transcriptomics, and proteomics, and there's um, many different data types that we can, um, we can data, data that we can gather from these different omics um, data levels. And so today I'm going to touch specifically on the genomics, epigenomics, and transcriptomics data. Um, and go through an overview of um, how we collect the data and then how we analyze it. So, um, as I mentioned, there is a large diversity of omics that we're currently studying in biomedicine. So, this slide was taken from the TCGA, which I'm going to talk a bit about. Um, and then I added some extra slides to represent proteomics and phosphoproteomics here. Um, but there, we can look at the genome, which is really the long-term storage information of the cell the transcriptome, which is the tr retrieval of this information, the proteome, which is the short-term information storage, and then um, how the signaling networks um, interact in the interactome, which we'll also touch on. So here's just um, a lot of the different levels of data that we can gather um, at this point. And so the, in terms of next-gen sequencing, we're really um, covering all from the microRNA up through the mutation calls. And that's what we're going to be focusing on. 
there has been a long history of studying the genetics of cancer, which uh, predates the proteogenomics of cancer. Um, and so the reason why genomics and cancer have become such an enormous field is because it's known that um, at the molecular level, cancer is caused by mutations that result in aberrant cell uh, proliferation. And these mutations can either be germline, meaning that they are inherited, or they can be somatic, meaning that they're acquired at some point in life. And um, these mutations, um, if they're occurring in oncogenes, um, they can cause overexpression of these oncogenes, oncogenes meaning that they increase oncogenesis, increasing um, tumor proliferation. Um, they can be fusion genes, they can be an altered gene product. So there's many examples of this that we'll, we will cover some of them in, in the hands-on, so such as ERBB2, which is one we're going to talk about specifically in the, in the genomics hands-on um, session. And then there's tumor suppressor genes. So these are genes that normally regulate cell differentiation and suppress the proliferation of the cell. So if those, um, so if there's mutations in these genes, there's an increase in, in the, that would reduce them. There's an increase in proliferation. So you can, we look at both tumor suppressor genes and oncogenes in terms of, of the mutations um, in the cell. And, um, and as I mentioned, there's many genomic drivers. Um, this was a, in 2010, they, there was a, um, I think this is in Nature. Uh, yes, in Nature. There's, there was an article about the cancer genome. Um, and the TCGA, which is the Cancer Genome Atlas, which I'm going to cover in a bit of more detail later, uh, really was one of the, one of the um, projects that spearheaded this. So they sequenced, um, actually, I, this is an outdated number. I think it's more like 11. 11,000 cancer genomes, um, over 33 different kinds of cancer. So it's a, it's a really wonderful data set that everyone has access to. Um, and there's also the International Cancer Genome Consortium, which is another um, large pr uh, project that has worked to collect lots and lots of genomics data for cancer that you can all also access. Um, and then there's what, what's called, oh, there's a typo there, and I apologize, COSMIC. Um, which is the catalog of somatic mutations in cancer. This, so this is just cataloging all of the mutations that have been found to occur in tumors as well. So this is another really good resource that's publicly available. So now I'm going to jump into genomics. I think a lot of you probably know this, but I realized I should probably have a slide in there just because, um, you know just in case, <laughs> otherwise you'll be completely lost after this. So um, the chemical structure of DNA and RNA, uh, so DNA is double-stranded, RNA is single-stranded, and there's these nitrogenous bases um, that make up nucleotides. They differ um, between DNA and RNA in that there's a thymine in DNA and a uracil in RNA. Triplets uh, of these uh, bases encode different amino acids, so that's um, something that we're going to go into. Okay. So just two slides on the history of sequencing, just because I think it's important to start, um, start there. So Sanger sequencing, which um, how many people have heard of Sanger sequencing? Is, okay, great. Wonderful. So this was developed by Frederick Sanger, who um, received the Nobel Prize in 1980 for these methods. Um, and it was the most widely used method for until next-gen sequencing came around. And we're going to spend most of our time talking about next-gen sequencing. So um, what, they, what this method did was use these modified nucleotides which attached to the DNA strands and each of them was tagged with a fluorescent label that identified which nucleotide it was. So I'll show a schematic of, of this. Um, so here we have our DNA template. So the double-stranded DNA was denatured to get a single-stranded DNA. Um, and then you add in these um, nucleotides that have um, either a non-fluorescent or fluorescent tag on them. And then you have uh, DNA polymerase. So it allows the strands to, to grow and become um, double-stranded because DNA polymerase is adding on these, um, these uh, deoxyribonucleotides. And whenever it gets to one where there's a fluorescent probe, it stops. So it keeps growing, and then it, it, these, these um, fluorescently tagged um, DDNTPs are randomly added. So as soon as they're added on, it stops. And then so you know that the, the, the length, this, um, what is it, six nucleotides up is a C, and seven is a G, and et cetera. And then you run this on a polyacrylamide gel, 
separate out the strands, and then you can use a fluorescent detector to figure out at what um, length each of the different nucleotides is at. So this worked really well. It just took a really long time. So um, eventually, next-gen sequencing came along. So this was established in the mid to late 90s, and it was based on this Sanger method, but it incorporated some new innovations. So how many people are you, have used like Illumina sequencing, for example? Okay. So there were more Sanger sequencing people here than Illumina. Um, yeah, so, so now um, what happens is you still have this DNA template, so it's a single-stranded DNA template, um, and it's fragmented, and there are adapters that are put on the template. And we're going to talk a lot about these adapters because we can do some cool stuff with them. Um, and then what happens is the, these fragments are attached to some, a solid support, like a flow cell, and we'll talk about that as well. And then there's an amplification that occurs. So that you stick your fragment onto this, this um, flow cell, and then you amplify it. So you end up getting a cluster of the same, of the exact same sequence um, that's stuck in a certain part of your flow cell. And then um, you, so this is what's called library prep. So this is how the library is prepped um, from your DNA template. And then what happens is we do what's called sequencing by synthesis. So it's similar to what I mentioned in the Sanger method, except now these fluorescently labeled nucleotides, um, you can actually, um, you can, you, when they, when they um, bind to the DNA, they stop the synthesis, but then you can remove the fluorescent probe um, so that you can continue to grow it. So you don't, in the Sanger sequencing, once it hit there, it stopped. Now you can take that floor off so you can keep growing instead of having to do um, all of the different lengths and then running it through a gel. Now you can just keep adding more and more on and just taking a, a photo um, every time the floor is put on. You take a photo, you remove it, et cetera, et cetera, until you grow it all the way up the strand. Um, and then the data is exported as a text file, uh, so it reads out what cluster it is, what read it is, and then the actual sequence. So this is a much faster and more efficient method than the Sanger sequencing. What we're going to talk about is a lot of these different methods. Um, okay, so um, genomics, uh, we have de novo sequencing, mutation discovery, exome and whole genome sequencing, and copy number alteration or variation and detection. Um, epigenomics, we have um, assays to look at transcriptional activity, protein DNA and interactions and methyl methylation analysis. And at the transcriptomics level, we can look at mRNA expression, alternative splicing, and microRNA expression. Um, and there's more. These are just some of the basics. So I included some current next-gen sequencing technology that's being used at the moment and sort of the newest instruments. So the most common one at this point is Illumina HiSeq. So, um, the, this one, um, I'm going to talk about why it's the most commonly used and what technologies they've come up with that have made it the most popular. Um, so Illumina HiSeq is commonly used for the whole genome and exome sequencing, targeted sequencing, RNA sequencing, chip seq. And it's really, you can parallelize a lot of samples at once. It's pretty fast. Um, and it's highly sensitive and has a high output. Uh, and then there's the Illumina MySeq, which uh, I wanted to introduce, but we won't talk about it much because it's not used much for cancer. Uh, it's mo mostly used for metagenomics, so um, microbiome data, uh, small bacterial sequences, so, um, or 16S ribosomal sequencing. And so the cost is higher compared to the HiSeq, but it's faster and has longer read lengths, which makes it good for these. Um, these other smaller uh, genomes that are less annotated. There is PacBio, and I'm going to go into each of these in more detail, um, which produces very long sequence reads, um, but it has very high error rates. Um, it's at this point frequently used in combination with Illumina because they offer different strengths. And then there's the Oxford Nanopore min Minion, um, which is super cool. Has anyone seen one of these? Okay, because they're, they're like USBs. 
um, which makes them pretty exciting. Uh, and they're also really good for long reads. Um, they're ideal for that reason for this bacterial and viral genomes. Um, they're very small. They have historically had very high error rates, um, but they are trying to improve this. We'll talk about that a little bit more too. So for Illumina, um, we talked about the library prep. So it happens in the same way that we discussed before, where you fragment them. So here I found, I found a couple of different, here it says 200 to 500, but I've seen different quote numbers for how long these fragments are. Um, and then so you, you then do this cluster generation on this flow cell. And the flow cell is really what um, I think made Illumina the um, top of the market for this. So they created this pattern flow cell so you could get really clustered, um, high, high cluster density. Um, and this increased the output of the actual sequencing analysis. So once you do this, um, the cluster generation on the flow cell, and I'm gonna talk a little bit about what this solid phase PCR is on the next slide. Um, you do the same sequence, the sequencing by synthesis that we talked about before, where you just keep adding on um, different nucleotides and just taking the picture of them as, as you go. Okay, so the solid phase PCR, um, which is also known as bridge amplification, what happens is you um, have your DNA that is fragmented and then you have these adapters. So again, the adapters are put on so that you can attach it to the flow cell. And then the DNA is denatured into single strands. So you break it into single strands and then you attach it to the flow cell. And then the single strands, they have these ada other adapters on that are sitting on the flow cell. So what happens is the single strands end up bridging over to attach to the complementary adapter sequence. So it creates this bridge. And um, then it's elongated by using DNA polymerase. So it creates this, a double strand, and then it's denatured again. So then it creates single strands again, and then it bridges over again, and it keeps creating um, these uh, more and more of these um, clusters. Yes? Yeah? Adapters are for a 5' and 3'. Correct. So uh, when you put it on the plate, why don't you put just the 5' on so that all the orientation will be in one end? Because here it seems from the diagram that both the 5' and the 3' are plated. Uh, are so plated. you're saying why not just put like all 5' okay. adapters on and all? So I don't think you can control which ones are going to stick. So but Three prime adapters are on the plate. Only the three prime yeah. are attached. So they are on in the same orientation. But the adapters themselves attach to the plate regardless. Oh, I see what you're saying. Why do you not? I think it's actually because you want, it's a good question. I'll look into it more. But my guess is that because you want to get both, if you do single stranded, you want to get it from both directions. So paired end versus single reads, which we'll, we'll talk about. I have a feeling that that's why, but I don't, I'll, I'll actually look into it. So thank you, that le led me perfectly to my next slide. <laughs> so, um, so paired end sequencing versus single end sequencing. Um, paired end sequencing is now really the norm for sequencing, um, but pr I think some people likely still use single end reads as well, so I figure we should talk about it. Um, so. What it means is that you're sequencing both ends of the fragments. So as I mentioned, the fragments are, let's say they're 500 base pairs long. Um, typically, when you, based on the reagents that are used for Illumina, you only measure 50 to 200 of those base pairs. So you're not measuring the full fragment. You're just measuring the ends of the fragment. Um, so if you do it just from one end, right, you're only gonna be measuring, let's say, those 100 base pairs on one end of your fragment. On the first, let's say, the first, three prime end. Um, but if you, if you read both the forward and the reverse, right, 100 on both sides, then you have a 300 base pair gap, but you have, three, two, you have 100 and 100 on both sides, and you know that 
they're from the same strand. So you know that that gap exists, but you can get both, you can get more information from that cluster than you would normally if you just did it from one direction. So really you're producing double the reads um, for the same amount of time. So it's a little more, it's more expensive, which is the limitation, but if you can do it, it's, it's, um, it's a better use of your sample and your time. And the alignment is much more accurate, and we'll talk about alignment. So when you actually take these um, reads and you try and align it to a reference genome, um, you have a lot more information on what, how to align it, because you have, even though you have that gap, you know exactly what is on both sides of that gap. So how um, this is done, and you sort of alluded to this in your question, there's, the, there's a, a sequence primer that's specific to the three prime and the five prime end. Um, and um, that's included in this adapter. Uh, yeah, so that is how the paired re end reads work. Any other questions on this? Yeah. So if you must know all the genome sequence of whatever you're going to do the next in the uh, next in year, and uh, specifically design the this adapter, like five months, like uh, 100 gas, 100 gas. Say, sorry, say that again. So how do you specifically, how do you uh, specifically uh, design the adapters? Yeah, so the adapter is, uh, only 100, uh, 150. Oh no, so that the, the fact that it only reads 100 or 150 is based on the, actually based on how much of the, it's like the Illumina gives you a certain amount of DDMTPs to actually make the reads. So it, it's more about the um, reagents you use than the primers. It's not random. It's not random. It's not random, no. But no, no, it's not random. The 150 is not random. Because you, you tell the Illumina how many times to, the, the instrument how many times to take a picture, right? You're going to say take 150 pictures and then stop because I know that my reagents can get me to 150. Yeah, yeah, that's not random. You'll always have 150 if you decide to do 150. So another thing you can stick in the adapters is um, a, a way of actually multiplexing your samples, which means you're, you're pooling lots and lots of samples together so you can run them all at once instead of just running one sample at a time. So um, what is done is there's a unique sequence that's added to the adapter that indicates um, what sample that that sequence came from. So during the library prep, you add these, um, these unique sequences on, um, and then that way when you mix them all up, and then you do all of your, your library, you, the library prep's done, and then you do your sequencing. After you have your data, you have this sequence that identifies, so the blues came from you know, sample one, and the pinks came from sample two, and then you can just, in terms of the bioinformatics, you can go in and, and pull out which ones came from which sample. So um, this is a very common technique at this point as well. Yeah. Uh, for doing video sequencing versus your targeted sequencing or resequencing, paired end would be better uh, compared to paired end would be better. Paired end would be better for targeted. I think paired end's always better, right? If you can afford it. <laughs> so it's the limitation for these things, right? Is that your question? Yeah. yeah. Better paired end or similar, uh, similar yeah, paradigm's always better if you can swing so it. You're doing targeted or DD. Yeah, yeah. So I did want to touch on the two other sequencing um, platforms that are not as commonly used, but I think they're going to become more and more present. So I wanted to talk about them a little bit. Let's, so there's this pack bio. Um, and they use um, this, what's called a SMART method that um, can produce really long reads. So the limitation with Illumina is, um, as we mentioned, that it will only go up to about 200 base pairs. So you, you, when you're aligning and you're trying to figure out where those sequences belong on the genome, you don't have a lot of information. You only have those base pairs. But if you have four, 
you know, 40 KB, then you have a lot of information and you can do de novo sequencing. You can, you can get a lot of information about, let's say you have an unknown um, species that you know, you know nothing about, you don't have a genome, so you can gather these long reads and then try and do de novo um, alignment and, and figure out the actual reference genome of a new species. So that's where these things um, typically come in. And um, another, this is, I'm not going to go into all the methods behind this. I did include, if you're interested, there is this paper that goes into a lot of the details on it. But um, it, it doesn't require this pause between the reading of the steps. So in Illumina, you know, you have the floors added on and you have to take a picture and then you have to take the floor off and then you put a new one on and you take a picture. So there's this pause step every time that you add a new one on. So in this method, that's not, that does not happen, so it's a lot faster. Um, so unfortunately, though, it has a very high error rate, so 15% is pretty, pretty bad. Um, so I think they're likely working on lowering this, um, but it's something to keep in mind. But it is still really good for de novo assembly of small genomes, um, structural variant identification, um, and you can actually directly identify epigenetic modifications without having to do another completely different type of omics analysis, which is very cool. Um, and then the other one, which is actually quite similar in terms of some of its, its um, benefits, is this Oxford uh, Minion, which again is this USB sized sequencer. Um, and it can do really ultra long read lengths, so up to hundreds of KB. Um, and what happens is, the way that they do this is there's this uh, protein pore that's actually an E. coli mutant um, of a CSG G protein. And they figured out that if you put this on a membrane, you can actually read the, um, the DNA strand through this pore. And the different bases, depending on what base is coming through the pore, it disrupts the current in a, a specific way that you can read electronically. Um, so I think this is super cool. Um, I think that the problem that I've heard from people who are more involved in the actual instrumentation of the field is that it actually goes too fast. So the reason why there are high error rates is because it's moving too quickly. Um, and they're trying to figure out how to slow it down. Uh, and I think it's, it, from what I've read, um, it has gotten um, a lot better. And there was a recent paper I included here that came out this year that actually used this to assemble a reference, um, a human reference genome. So it was just kind of a proof of concept paper to show that you could use this to do some of the stuff that we've previously just used Illumina for. So um, I think that this is a very exciting um, development in, in next-gen sequencing, especially because you can just hold it and take it to the places and sequence, I guess, whatever you want to. So um, there are a lot of different file formats that we'll talk about, uh, just because um, I, you know, I sit in the data analysis side of most of this, so I don't typically do, I do work with people who do sequencing, and I work with the, with the, the, um, the Genomics T Technology Center at NYU a lot, and so I'm familiar with they, what they do, but I typically just get the data after. Um, that's what I prefer. Uh, so I wanted to talk a little bit about file formats. So um, the raw data is typically in what's called a FASTQ format. There is a GenBank format, which is an SRA. There is alignment formats, which are SAMs and BAMs. There are these genome browser formats, and then there's genomic variant formats, and we'll talk about each of these in uh, some level of detail. So the FASTQ, has anyone seen a FASTQ? Has everyone seen a FASTQ? Who's seen a FASTQ? Okay. Some people. Okay. So um, this is what, this is an example of what it looks like. So it just starts with information on the actual um, instrument and then run number. Um, and then it has information on the flow cell. This is an Illumina FASTQ. It depends on the instrument. I'm just showing you the Illumina, Illumina FASTQ because I think that's, again, the most common for cancer genomics. So the flow cell ID, the lane, and the tile. So you can see here if there, there's a flow cell, contains eight lanes, and then each lane has two columns of tiles. So you really get exactly where 
um, this sequence was in terms of the flow cell um, coordinates. And then you also get an X and a Y coordinate of the cluster on the tile. You get a read number, so if it's um, single um, reads, you'll only have a one. If it's paired in, you'll have a one and a two. And then um, if it's filtered out for quality reasons, you get a yes here. If it's kept, you get a no. And then there's a sample number. And then there's the actual sequence. And then you get this quality score, which is a, it's an encoded score using ASCII characters um, to represent the quality score of each of the bases. So it ranges from zero to 40 in terms of quality. Um, and you can use there, there's a key that goes along with the Illumina that just shows exactly what each of these corresponds to, so. In today's lecture, you got an overview of genomic technologies and especially its relevance in context of cancer and how it could actually provide a broader overview to understand any disease or clinical conditions. You also learnt why in genomic sequencing two side reads are important as compared to the single reads and how it can affect the accuracy of sequencing. You also learnt about gene sequencing, how it has evolved over the years and now we have not only achieved much higher accuracy of sequencing in a much shorter time frame and in a very very cost effective manner, but also the instruments have become much more miniaturized and one could see the examples like Oxford nanopore technology mini ion which is very easy to carry and transport anywhere as per the requirements. Dr. Kerry has also introduced and made you familiarized with availability of data sets and how to uh, obtain different type of raw files and format them for various parameters for further analysis. Let us continue the next lecture in the same flow of genomics where Dr. Kelly is going to talk to you about the sequencing alignments and various factors which affects that. Thank you.